I don't know if any of you are familiar with the concept. I'm sure most of you are. This is pretty common knowledge. The concept of bloodletting. This was an archaic practice that doctors used to do. Like for centuries, people would come in, they'd feel sick, and doctors would say, the solution for you is let's cut you open. And this was from the theory of humorism. And it was that the body was governed by these four humors. It was blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And the theory was that by letting the blood out, you would balance these humors out and you would cure disease. And it wasn't until the 19th century that with the advancement of medical science and germ theory that these archaic practices were revealed to be pretty much ineffective and generally more harmful than helpful. And in a similar way, the church in Corinth sort of had this idea that what they were doing was right. They had this idea that they were doing the right thing. But as we'll explore in 1 Corinthians 11, we'll see that, you know, just because they believed it, what they, what they actually were doing was hurting the church. They thought they were helping. They thought they were doing the right thing, but they were actually hurting the church. And Paul's going to lay some knowledge on them. They are doing way more harm than good. And so this morning, we'll be looking at three things from this passage. We'll be looking at the problem. So the people of Corinth had a gross misunderstanding of what the Lord's Supper meant, its nature and its seriousness. Uh, Secondly, we'll be looking at the solution. The the people of Corinth needed to refocus on what the Lord's Supper was, what the bread and the wine pointed to, and then re-establish themselves in alignment with that. Finally, we'll see the calling. The calling that was on the church in Corinth, but is to all believers as well, that is to live lives to reflect the hope that the bread and the wine point to. I'll pray and we'll get into our Bibles. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together under your word. Lord, we pray that you would uh, open us up, help our eyes see what your word has for us, help us by your spirit to discern what it is challenging us to do. Um, Help us live lives that um, honour each other, uh, honour you, and uh, live in memory and remembrance of what you have achieved. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11, we'll be starting at verse 17. I'll read the, the full passage. So I'll give you a tick to get there. So starting at verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and to drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it, is, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I'll give direction when I come. So last week... The church in Corinth got some 
well-needed praise. Paul's been hounding on them for most of it. They finally got a little bit of, you know, you're doing well in this one regard. This week he's back to a bit more criticism. Um, They're not remembering. They're not doing a good job of remembering what he's taught them. This week, he's not happy. He says in verse 17, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. This is when we need some cultural and historical analysis. During the week, much like we do now, but the, the church would meet in much smaller groups in houses scattered around the city. That's what most historians seem to agree on. And then on Sunday, the church would gather together as one bigger body. And so in the little groups, these financial distinctions that are the mark of the Corinthian church were probably a little less prominent. The, the little groups would meet in the poor, and the, the poor people would meet with the poor people because they live near them. The rich people would meet with the rich people. And these social hierarchical distinctions were a little less obvious. And this is similar to Plimpton, except for the rich thing, I hope. Um, but, you know, we meet on DGs, in DGs on weeknights. We love it. You know, these are a little more intimate, a little more vulnerable, and we share in the things like food and life and friendship and wine. And then, like today, we gather together as a whole community. This is the church of City Light Plimpton. And so Corinth wasn't marked by its unity. I think as City Light Plimpton, we're largely marked by unity, I hope. Um, But Paul says that Corinth isn't marked by its unity. He says that there are divisions among you. They're not really coming together when they come together. Unfortunately, we've seen this a lot throughout this series. So Paul has good reason to believe they're lacking in unity. In chapter 1, there was disunity about who they should follow, which which sophist or wise person they should adhere to. Chapter 3, there was disunity. Paul calls it their jealousy and quarreling. In chapter 6, they're suing each other. That's disunity as far as I'm concerned. So this is just another instance of the church in Corinth allowing the prevailing culture to dictate how they should conduct themselves. I think this is like, they're like a little schoolboy who's just way too easily influenced. I was like that. I, was e- I easily succumbed to peer pressure, very easily. My parents will attest to that. Um, but Corinth is like that. Like They're just doing whatever the culture tells them to do without really considering the theological or cultural impact that it has on the church. And so Paul diagnoses this fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be the church and the body of Christ. He points to this maxim that seems to have made its way into the church. Look at verse 19. He says, For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Most scholars agree this probably isn't Paul asserting this. He doesn't believe this. What he's probably doing is quoting this, what they've been saying. That, that people are saying that it's, it's only necessary, it's natural that God would start to discern between the, the privileged or the, the blessed and the unblessed. Um, it's sort of saying that you know, those who are rich are you know, God's favoured people and those who are poor are less favoured. Those who are rich clearly are, have it right, they're theologically accurate and God's sorting them out according to his divine will. It's like the goat from the sheep or sifting the chaff. And Paul's not happy about this. The following verses can demonstrate that they may think that this insensitive elitist behavior is reflection of God's good disposition towards the church. But what Paul's saying is actually it's, it's entirely the opposite. It's not meeting with God's approval. You're undermining the very fabric of the church in your conduct. And it's showing up in the Lord's Supper, most preeminently. Look at verse 20. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat in and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. He's not happy about it. This is when we... Like, this is the beauty of even secular research in looking at Bible 
knowledge and looking at how we understand scripture. Uh, um, Jerome Murphy O'Connor is a Catholic scholar and he's done a ton of work looking at how architecture and the building of, of, of buildings in first century Greece and Rome, the Roman Empire impacted or and how that can help us understand some of these passages. And one thing he looked at was this distinction between the rich and the poor that shows up in house architecture, especially in the context of rich homes. Um, in rich homes, there would be this central room called the triclinium, or triclinium. Um, Chris Fresh will probably correct me on the pronunciation of that. Um, and that was reserved for important meals with, with special people. It was like that dining room table, or like the dining room that you never went to in your grandparents' place, that was only for a special occasion. They'd bring out the fine china, and you know, the kids had to sit in the other room on the fold out table while the parents ate their nice meal. It was like that. It was this special room set apart for, for really good occasions. There'd be three benches around this central table, um, even in a really big house, like a really rich person you'd have a tight nine fitting in this room. It's, it's a small room, and it's only for the, the, the most prestigious, prestigious guests. And the finest food, they'd get the finest wine, they'd be doted upon by servants, they'd be fed till they're bursting. Outside this room, though, was the atrium, where the poorer and less prestigious guests would sit. They'd be fed, but it'd probably be inferior food. They'd get some, some wine, but it's probably not the best wine, there wouldn't be comfortable seating, um, and these dining practices reinforced this social hierarchy and made a distinction between the wealthy and the poor. I, I love flying, but what it gets me every time you walk through the first class and you know, you, you sit down in your cattle class seat with me, who's a bit too tall with no leg room, and then you watch, you, you can see me first class, they're sitting there, they're getting the little warm towels, and then as once you're in the air, what do they do? They close the curtains. They want to make it very clear who is in first class and who's not in first class. These people are not your people. I don't think they need the curtain. I think it's really just to enforce this idea that you are not allowed in here. You are not part of the privileged. And I think that's, that's fine in a commercial flight, right? Like, they pay their money, means I get cheaper flight, it's fine. But I don't think it's fine in the church. And I don't think Paul is either. I don't think, I don't think this sort of social hierarchy can be condoned. Even if they were the ones giving all the money so that they could fund the church, I still don't think that's okay. And I don't think Paul thinks it either. And so these wealthier Christian hosts were, were doing this. They would have their church gathering and only the closest and most respected people would be allowed in this triclinium inside. You know, they'd get the good food, they'd get, get the good wine, while outside... There's the cattle class, you know, they get a little bit of food, they might get a cracker or two. And there's this unmistakable distinction between the haves and the haves nots. So the rich church members seem to think that they were partaking of the Lord's Supper when they were doing this. They were, you know, they were drinking the wine, they were remembering Jesus' work in some capacity. But Paul says, no, you, you might think you are, but you're not really taking it. Not while you're making a mockery of everything that it stands for. Uh, Gordon Fee and Thistleton have highlighted the stark contrast in these meals, right? This, this gluttonous affair contrasted with the Lord's Supper. That's a possessive word. It, it, it belongs to the Lord. It's, it's the Lord's Supper. They're eating their own meals, these meals of gluttony and indulgence. They're not eating the Lord's meal, which is marked by humility and, and, and love and like gentleness and kindness, the segregating is causing harm to the church, not building it up, which should be what the Lord's Supper achieves. Just because they, have, they own the home doesn't give them the right to blur the lines between private meals and the sacred meal, which is the Lord's Supper. You can't claim to have a legitimate church gathering, then split it down the middle between the haves and the have-nots. That's Paul's point. It's like if we were to have here every week... We get together, there's a group of us who get a private chef, we get the sirloin steaks, we get the grange, and everyone else eats Rice Krispies, you know, like outside. I mean, I, I, I would love that if everyone got that, but I'm not going to advocate for that, sorry, Don. <laughs> I mean, it'd feel pretty good to be in the inner sanctum, wouldn't it? 
like you'd, you'd, you'd want to be in there, but it creates this horrible divide. It just, it so plainly shows that, that, that there's, there's these distinctions that should not be, this division that's over something that shouldn't be divided. And Paul's not having it. He's not going to let the prevailing culture determine how the church conducts himself. And Paul is forceful in condemning this behavior because it goes against the core of Christian values, values that are meant to transcend this sort of institutional, social institutions, right? This social stratification that was so common in Corinth just shouldn't be showing up in churches. We should be fostering mutual respect and love among our believers, regardless of where their background is, who they are, the class they're from, how much money they are. That's what we're called to do. We're called to ensure that church gatherings are a true reflection of Christ's self-giving love and the equality of all believers in him. So here are some questions to consider. Um, What current practices in the church whether in worship, small groups, or just general fellowship, create divisions based on social, economic, or cultural status. How are you involved in this? What steps can you, in your capacity, whatever capacity that is, take to bridge that divide? Are you making a conscious effort to ensure that every member feels welcome and valued? Finally, are you regularly emphasizing in your practice the gospel's message of unity through Jesus? Okay. The church in Corinth was, was marked by these divisions like during the Lord's Supper. These divisions reflect a misunderstanding of the purpose of the Lord's Supper, right? Paul presents the solution. This is point two. We need to remember why we eat the Lord's Supper, not just that we do eat the Lord's Supper, not just that we should, we know we should, but we need to remember why we eat it. It seems the people of Corinth have retained at least some knowledge about the practice of the Lord's Supper. They knew that they were supposed to do it. They they thought it was a good idea, but their practice demonstrated that they had completely misunderstood or forgotten what the meal pointed to. They were treating this meal as a fun celebration, a great reason to catch up with friends and have a great meal and get full. And Paul points them back to the tradition, which is Christ's tradition. Christ instituted this. Paul doesn't hold it on to his own authority. He doesn't say, you know, do this because I'm Paul. He says, do it because Jesus did it. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. This is Jesus's meal. And he reminds them of why the Lord's Supper is so crucial. It's transcendently significant in the life of the church and demonstrates why its misuse is so harmful to the body of Christ. And Paul's solution to their problem is to re-emphasize what the meal points to, not the meal itself as an end. He says in verse 23, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed or handed over, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There are three key ideas in this short little passage. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant can be contrasted with the old covenant. Those of you familiar with the Bible, generally, you could say, split into two major covenants, the old and the new covenant. Um, The old covenant was established at Mount Sinai. It was centered around the Mosaic law. It was a strict system of laws and rituals and sacrifices designed to maintain a right relationship with God. This covenant highlighted the need for obedience and faithfulness for believers. But if you've read the Old Testament or Romans or most of the New Testament even, you would have noticed that the Old Covenant also revealed humans' propensity for disobedience. Like They're just constantly breaking the Old Covenant over and over and over again. And in the Old Covenant, there were provisions for when you broke the covenant, you know, when you sinned. Many of these provisions involved the sacrifice of animals and spreading blood on the altar. 
Um, but as the author of Hebrews makes clear, these provisions were only temporary. They didn't adequately atone for the sins of the people. He says in chapter 10, the author of Hebrews, that is, in verse 1, he says, For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continued, continually offered each year, make perfect those who draw near. And verse 4 says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So this old covenant was this temporary administration that highlighted human failure and our need for a saviour. All those bulls, all those sheep, all those goats, all those pigeons that were sacrificed, all they did was point to the greater need that the people had for lasting and effective sacrifice, for a lasting and effective sacrifice. Even the story of Isaac and Abraham, which we discussed a few weeks ago, just, just overemphasize this need for a substitution that we have. We, we, we need someone in our place. Hebrews 8, the author quoting Jeremiah 31, makes this point super clear. Um, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The significance of Jesus' statement here can't be overstated. The old covenant, the one which pointed to the new covenant, the one which Israel had been waiting thousands of years for, they were just eagerly, eagerly, eagerly waiting for this covenant. Jesus is saying here, it's here. I, I'm, I'm, I bring it in here. This is, this is the new covenant in my blood, in my body. This is the new covenant which is being established God's bringing this new new covenant. And that covenant will be sealed by this blood which this wine and this bread point to. It's going to be given for my people that they may be saved. Not so that they have to continually re-offer sacrifices, but as one lasting sacrifice that atones for the sins of his people. It's a gracious, eternal covenant. And it brings regeneration and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is what we believe as Christians. This is so exciting. This is fantastic news. I think we need to be careful to remember that, that Jesus didn't go involuntarily to the cross as well. Like this is Jesus handing himself over at this point, saying this covenant is established tonight by me, who is God. Um, so this wasn't, he wasn't caught off of guard. And Jesus' sacrifice was the quintessential, or the quintessence even, of the sacrificial act. This was the voluntary self-renouncement of freedom and life. Jesus made himself nothing so that we could have everything. This is the God we worship, a God who is the epitome of self-sacrifice and humility. This, this ties back to Paul's central point. The Corinthians should be mimicking this disposition in their church gatherings. The, the Corinthians seem to think that they were in some capacity, you know, worthy of honour for taking the Lord's Supper. But Paul's very clear, they deserve no such praise. They're acting entirely in opposition to what the tradition points to. They're acting elitist when the bread and the wine point to humility in its fundamental sense in Christ. Paul calls them to remember Remember their Saviour and their Lord. That is the solution to their misunderstanding. Remembrance. But, but what does it mean to remember? I think this is, this is, we often have this misunderstanding of what it means to remember. It's not just to look back at something and fondly remember it. Um, especially throughout Scripture, we see that um, you know, it has this tangible material effect. Remembrance has this tangible effect on how we conduct ourselves. Uh, Thistleton comments that to remember God's mighty acts or to remember the poor is not simply to call them to mind, but to assign them an active role within one's world. That means it should change who we are. When we remember something, it should have a material impact on our conduct. We see this throughout Scripture um, in, in Psalm twenty two thirty seven. The psalmist calls us to remember, or the, he says, at the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. So remembrance leads to worship. 
in Judges 8.34, the, the flip side is shown of not remembering. They turn their back. It says, And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of their enemies on every side. So failure, is, failure to remember is not just this absent-mindedness. It's unfaithfulness to the covenant and it's active disobedience against God. So in the New Testament, we see this too. In 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll deal with next year. So excited for that chapter, by the way. Read ahead, it's so good. They're reminded of the gospel they first received and it calls them to change their current action and live lives that reflect that. In Galatians 2.10, it says, remember the poor. All they, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. The very thing I'd been eager to do all along. Remembrance has consequences. It forces you. It like If you're actively remembering, it will impact how you conduct yourselves. So when we remember the sacrificial work of Christ, we identify with the past event of Christ's death and our union with him through the Spirit. So that's the aspect of remembering that looks backwards. There's a degree to which we affirm our corporate and personal identity as the body of Christ. And then finally, we are pointed forward. So we look back, we look at our now, and we look forward to our future reality of dining with Christ in the new creation. So that's what we do when we take the Lord's Supper. We, remembrance has three components, at least. There's the past, present, and future aspect of the Lord's Supper. And so the effect is that we should be filled with hope based on what Christ has done and motivated to proclaim his saving work to each other, to ourselves, and to the world. So there's a degree to which when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming the gospel to each other. Paul, quoting Jesus, says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So this, this simple act, like it's a very simple act. It reflects our active engagement with the cross. It signifies that we have not only received regeneration through Christ, but we've also adopted a way of life that reflects that redemption. It embodies his self-sacrificing life of Jesus. And so this is what we are reminded of when we take the Lord's Supper. Not just that we were saved through Jesus' death, but that we put to death our sin, or Jesus put to death our sin. He brought our resurrection, and it should be a life eternal that is marked by transformation through the Holy Spirit. And so as we're called to do this until the Lord comes, as always, point, like Paul, Paul does this repeatedly. I think I mention this every time I preach. Paul always, or almost always, when he critiques something, he, he, he points to the future hope in the hope that will influence our present action. All right? We're on a pilgrimage as we await for our Lord. The Lord's Supper is this foretaste of what it will be like to receive Christ when he returns in glory. He's going to fulfill all his promises, and there's this wonderful promise of the Supper of the Lamb that we, we receive. It's a feast for all who believe in Christ. It's an incredible moment where we'll, deal with, we'll dwell with Christ. We're going to eat with Christ in person at the Lord's Supper in person eventually. And so when we eat the Lord's Supper, we're called to remember what he has done, remember who God has made us, and remember the wonderful hope that we have when Christ returns. So it's not just about recalling, it directly impacts how we act today, and it shapes how we view each other hugely. So this leads to our third and final point. We've seen the problem, we've seen the solution, now we have the call on believers, the call to examine ourselves and to care for others. Paul says in verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why so many of you are weak and ill and some have died. So in this passage, there is this stark warning, right? Don't eat in an unworthy manner concerning the body and blood of Christ or the Lord. What does that mean? If we look at what Paul has been saying throughout this chapter, there are two things which 
This, I think there's two ways in which this can be understood. Right? I think this could be either referring to the church. So to eat in an unworthy manner is to humiliate. It means to be demeaning the body of Christ or disrespecting other members of Christ's community. That's what it means to not discern the body. Or it could mean sinning against the new covenant that Christ established through his death. So that means if we're eating the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, it means being kind by being unkind or cruel to other members of the church community. We're disrespecting Jesus' physical body, which he gave for us. I think actually an integrated understanding is probably best. Um, I think when we sin against the body of Christ, which is the church, we disrespect Christ and we devalue the sacrifice which he made and we undermine the covenant which he made with the church. So it's that, that mutual thing of by, by, by not loving each other as the body of Christ, we're actually sinning against God in, and disrespecting the, the sacrifice he gave. We're making it seem like it has achieved less. And so taking part in the Lord's Supper while harboring divisions or treating others poorly undermines that unity and the I mean, it undermines the unity that the sacrament points to through that body, through that blood, we're united. By being divided when we take it, it, it totally undermines the message that we're trying to convey. And so when we take communion, we're called to, to reflect on the relationship we have with Christ and the relationship we have with the church. We're called to examine ourselves, testing whether our posture is one of humility and repentance one of acknowledging Christ's sacrifice, our place as his people. At communion, we are united with believers in the church. We're united with believers at Plimpton. We're united with believers around the world. We, we, we share in this body, as this body of Christ. Um, and we, we point to the redemption that was achieved through his blood. And so we're called to serve each other humbly and sacrificially, viewing each other as greater than ourselves, there's also a degree to which we should be considering our sins and considering the sacrifice which Christ had to pay for those sins. Consider the salvation that it has brought us. Consider the calling on our lives to live in light of that sacrifice. It shouldn't be a time of fearful, like if, you're not, if you don't feel like you're up to the task of being a, a perfect sinless Christian, welcome to the club. The point of taking communion isn't to come to it perfect. It's to remember what Christ has achieved that allows you to take it. You are not a perfect human, nor am I, unfortunately. Um, some are closer than others, maybe. I'm pretty far off. But, I, but the beauty is we still get to come to the Lord's Supper knowing that through that act, through his death, we're made right. It should be a celebration should be a, a time of joy, but also of great introspective consideration of what it cost. But clearly this meal isn't to be taken lightly. It's both transcendent and ordinary. It is really just a cracker and juice. But we see that God takes it very seriously. The Corinthian church was undermining the significance and the beauty of this meal to such a degree that it was bringing divine judgment on the church. They had taken something that is, should be beautiful. It should be highlighting the most incredible moment in human history, and they were making it a time to get drunk and have a bit of fun. And God's not happy about it. He says that many are weak, sick, and dying because they're undermining this precious meal. God is disciplining the church in Corinth, and it seems that they needed Paul to call it out to them. I think they were a bit oblivious to this. So he says in verse 31, But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when you are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the Lord. The world, sorry. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when, together, when you come together, you will not come for judgment. We can't overstress how important this meal is. Paul wants us to realize that the way we behave in worship and the way we treat each other as members of the body of God are not to be taken lightly. It requires the most serious and introspective consideration. So he calls for the church to be more discerning, but also for us to be more discerning in how we conduct ourselves, to allow the Holy Spirit 
at the time of the Lord's Supper to call things to mind, to pass through a form of judgment, but also a time of being accepted by God's grace, to, to feel the weight of your sins, but also to feel the wonderful grace that has been imparted to you. So we should take the Lord's Supper with reverence, because it's when we remember in every aspect of the word remember what God has done. This is why the actions of the wealthy in Corinth are so heinous. The core issue is that the wealthy members of the church were eating in private, shaming the poor, tarnishing the Lord's Supper. They were undermining the very message of the cross, which is the epitome of humility and love. So rather than preach the wonders of God's mercy and his unmatched ability to bring people together, the rich were treating it like a fun reason to have a party. And he calls them to take it seriously, reflect the Christ-centered and unified community that they are and we are called to be. Paul's instruction is not merely about waiting for others. It's about ensuring that everyone participates equally in the life of the church reflecting our cohesive unity as a body. We are all equal under God. And so it's the purpose of the Lord's Supper is to proclaim Christ's death and unite believers as a body. And proper participation requires focusing on inclusivity rather than allowing social distinctions to cause division. Proper participation, participation requires a mentality of humility and submission, a mindset of repentance, a mindset of appreciation for what Christ has achieved. So when we take communion in a moment, remember in the full sense of the word, remember the point of this time is to recognize the tremendous significance of Jesus' death, to remember with gratitude and humility the amazing sacrifice given to you bringing you from life to death through his death and resurrection. To appreciate and acknowledge what God has made us into as one body here at City Light Plimpton. We're made up from people with people from all walks of life. And that's beautiful. We should recognize that. To be challenged to align our lives and mimic God's absolute, unequivocal, unmatched humility and selflessness, selflessness. If you're not a believer, we, we do ask that you remain seated during this time. Um, this is a time that is, in accordance with Scripture, reserved, we believe, for believers, those who have accepted Christ as their Lord. But, but do take the time to remember and consider this opportunity that presents itself. It's the opportunity to be made right with God. That's a wonderful opportunity. You can be brought into this family, this united family that loves God. All you have to do is trust that that death is for you. If you want to talk more about that, we would love to talk about that. Um, we, any, any of us, like Don, myself, happy to talk to you about that. We desperately, desperately need a saviour. So as we eat, remember the wonderful saviour we have what he has achieved for you and what he is calling you to live as a Christian. I'll pray. And if you're a believer, come, eat, remember what Christ has done. Lord, we know that we are so easily forgetful. We are so prone to forgetting the wonderful work you have done in our lives. Lord, we are so prone to thinking that... Um, yeah, we are better than others, that we are more worthy of your love than others. Uh, we're so prone to uh, fabricating social divisions where there should be none. Our Lord, help us treat each other with the kindness and love and humility that you have treated us with. Help us, uh, Lord, remember the, our, our sin. Help us bring, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, bring to us sins in our lives that um, we need to repent of to you so that we may come to the table um, just overjoyed with your wonderful grace. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.